Okay. So, um, as Gaurav said, I'll be presenting today about uh, how three different defensive compounds in Bentamiana affect its defense in a natural setting. And this project started in um, in our lab um, before me with another postdoc, Hong Lin. I'll try that first. Um, and what he wanted to do, to do is he wanted to create Bentamiana plants that were susceptible to insects. And you might ask, why do we want Bentamiana plants susceptible to insects? The reason is Bentamiana is very actually naturally resistant to insects. And if you want to use it, the molecular tools of Bentamiana in insect assays, it's hard to do it when it's so um, resistant. So if you want to overexpress a gene, for example, and then uh, uh, see what it does, then you need the plant to be susceptible. If it's naturally resistant to aphids, for example, you can't check how this metabolite affects aphids. So he targeted the acyl sugar gene, um, targeted ACEP1 um, and ACEP2. And you can see there are four um, acyl sugars he profiled in Bentamiana. They all have this um, sucrose core and different um, aliphatic chains on them, longer ones, shorter ones. Um, and he knocked out basically, this is the main one, and he knocked out two genes, ASAT1 and ASAT2, and he saw that when he knocks out ASAT2, he basically gets um, almost no acyl sugars in this Bentamiana. And um, what he saw is he saw that this um, really affects the survival, um, it affects um, the aphid size, it affects um, aphid reproduction, and also in choice assays, um, we can see it, it affects um, if it's preferred to uh, be on the acyl sugar mutants. But he didn't stop there. He said, how can I make the plants even more susceptible um, to aphids? And then he used data we had in our lab, um, which used the bioassay with aphids and the VIGS plants. And here they found um, a VIGS a mutant, which was most susceptible to aphids. They recognized this as a certain, um, certain protease inhibitor. And he CRISPRed it. And he found that it affects less things than the acyl sugars do, um, but it does affect aphid survival, um, aphid size. It doesn't affect reproduction or the choice assays, but um, that was surprising because usually serpenes are, are um, mentioned more in caterpillar and less in aphids. So when I came, I had just finished a project in a SAS lab about um, knocking out anabasine production in tree tobacco. And I said, well, we have this very abundant metabolite in Bentamiana. Bentamiana makes nicotine and not anabasine. Um, why don't I knock it out? I know I had this one gene, A622, um, which knocks out all the pyridine alkaloids. So not only anabasine or nicotine, it knocks them both out and nor nicotine and anatabine. Why don't I target it in um, Bentamiana? And nicotine is synthesized. It's an interesting pathway in general. It has this... Um, um, a pyridine and nucleotide cycle from which um, we, A622 um, makes from nicotinic acid this 3,6-dehydro um, nicotinic acid, which has been connected by the BBL with a second um, metabolite from a different pathway to get nicotine. And A622 basically knocks it all out. So this was my plan. So I said, okay, I want to make plants even more susceptible to insects, but why not do other things on the way? So I said, since I also come from projects checking what metabolites do in the field in a soft lab, I said, I can have this amazing mutant population and I can check how these different metabolites affect different insects and how the combinations affect different insects. So my plan was to have the single mutants, the acyl sugar, serpene, and the nicotine mutant, and then just make all the doubles as well and have the triple mutant. And I was hoping to see different insects coming to them in the field. So the way I did this, um, using this new method um, from the Voita, newish method, I guess, um, from the Voita lab, which uses um, TRV expression of the guide RNAs in the background of Cas9 expressing plants. And you basically just um, um, put your um, guides into this plasmid and between the code proteins, and then they're expressed. Um, after them, there's a part of the FT gene and that takes them to the meristem. And this gets really, really high efficiency um, uh, mutation. And it had two different constructs. I had one which had 
um, three guides for the A622 gene, and I had one which I also put in to acyl sugar um, targets. And this is the scheme of uh, how I actually did this. So I had Cas9 expressing plants, and then their background, I uh, had either the um, plasmid targeting only the A622 or the one targeting them both. And you might ask why I didn't use the A622 mutants as background, because they had the wrong Cas9. This works in Bentamiana only with a specific Cas9, with a PCO Cas9, not just with anyone. Um, so um, th that was supposed to give me these two. And then I used the serpene um, mutant background, which had the, the um, proper Cas9. And I, again, used both um, plasmid on its background to give serpene and nicotine mutants the triple mutants. And I was also hoping that um, because um, you never get all the mutations, that some mutations wouldn't be uh, mutated in A622, but would be in the acyl sugars. So that would give me the other double. And the way I screen this, so there really isn't a way to screen in this method, because basically all of the plants have the Cas9, so you can't scan using PCR for Cas9, for example. Um, so you, either you go and sequence all the plants, or you can sequence by the metabolites. So I chose the sequence by metabolites. And um, so I just look for nicotine and acyl sugars in the different um, lines and try to find them, them that way. Um, so here you can see the screen, this is a T1 generation. You can see a very high frequency of mutations in the Cas9 background with uh, just um, targeting A622. Um, not as good with the serpene uh, background. And here are the doubles on the Cas9 background. We do have doubles here. The one two is a double, the two two is a double. And the triple was a bit harder. And the problem actually was, it wasn't that I didn't get any mutants, it was that the mutants were small. And I thought there was a genetic basis in the beginning, but I looked for a very long time for this triple mutant, actually looked for it for so long that I didn't manage to make it by the field experiments and they only joined in a later stage. And this is the two, T2 generation. Again, you can see that uh, these plants are really, um, they carry on to the T2. Um, and in terms of the different mutations we got, so it was really a very wide um, range. I think the most common one was this um, basically cutting out between guides one and three. So the whole um, area region in between them, it's like a thousand something base pairs. Um, that was in, in, a, in a few of them. And then we had other mutations like always happens with CRISPR, like bigger chunks cut out, um, then Indels in two of the guides, um, in three of the guides, in one of the guides, different guides. They all give the same phenotype, basically. It doesn't really matter. Um, in the ASAT, um, so these are the mutations, not Hong Lin's. Hong Lin's had his own mutations, but we sometimes also got fragments cut out between the guides, larger deletions, um, indels. Um, I always find it nice that when you have a three base pair deletion, which is only affecting one or two amino acids, the phenotype is the same. That's always how it happens for me, um, but it was. So these are, these are the mutations we had. And with this population, which was characterized, we went out to the field. Um, and this is the field site. So it's a natural field. So I differentiate usually between an agricultural setting and a natural setting. So agricultural, right, you'd have it plowed and you'd have it irrigated and you'd have it sprayed and you'd have it very, um, a lot of input uh, into it throughout. So this field is a natural setting. It's basically a wild field. It was plowed. If it's not plowed, you can't really do anything with it. The location is, so this is Ithaca over here, um, Dryden over here. These are the Varna Cliffs. This is Anarag's actually field um, by the Dice uh, Honey uh, Bee Lab. And this is a, a, a bigger uh, picture. It is was deer excluded. There was a fence around it. So no deer came in. It did not exclude groundhogs, unfortunately, but that's another story. Um, this is what the field look like, looks like, and this is um, the uh, setting. And the setting is, it's blocks of 14. So each of these blocks of 14 um, has, there's seven basically different um, lines. So there's wild type and six mutations and two independent lines of each. And it's randomized, but rational randomization. So making sure that always, um, the um, plants have the same exposure um, proportion to the different um, size of the field. So we don't have one which is 
exposed to the, to the edges more than the other, or inner compared to outer circles, and we had 24 blocks, um, meter between blocks, 40 centimeters between plants in the block. And this is what we saw. So in terms of height and survival, we did have this phenotype of A622 mutants being smaller. And this is a actually well-known phenotype. It's been reported for um, tobacco plants, Nicotiana tobacco. I didn't see it actually in my um, uh, Glauca plants, in my tree tobacco plants, um, which is why I targeted the gene among other things. I didn't think it would have this issue, um, but it did have it. And although the plants that we took out to the field were size matched, we did manage to grow them in conditions that, that were um, that would um, cause them to be the same size when we planted them. In the field, the conditions were a bit different and they were smaller. And I don't think this has to do with actually the interaction with the insects, more this A622 uh, specific one, but this affected survival. So they survived significantly uh, less than the other, um, than wild type here. And also in terms of height, they were shorter, which could be expected. What's interesting here is that the A622 mutants were shorter as well. And this has to do with the insect interaction. Now, one of the things that I saw while I was observing the, uh, the plants there in the field was that the double A620, um, the ASAT, the acyl sugar and serpene mutants didn't really behave like the other um, ASAT mutants. So I went and I checked the metabolites in the field and really surprisingly, for me at least, um, these um, double serpene and acyl sugar mutants weren't really mutated in the acyl sugars. So you can see it. this is this line here. And that's why I called it um, Cas9 SERP2 because I didn't remove it because it still is a serpent mutant. So we have another serpent line, kind of nice to have two separate lines coming from completely different backgrounds um, for the serpent. Um, but we see the nicotine mutants are really nicotine mutants. Other acyl sugars are really um, very much reduced in acyl sugars. And what did we see? Okay, uh, this is another, um, I went and I checked um, all the plants that were supposed to be mutated in, in acyl sugar and serpene, and it was really across these two completely independent lines. And I really don't know what the story is there. I guess the first phenotyping stage, um, something was wrong. And I really saw an enormous diversity of interactions in the field, and this is just some of what we saw. And I divide the interactions by feeding uh, guilds. So what their interaction is and in general feeding and non-feeding interactions. So here on the left, you can see we have um, flown feeders. So these are all uh, leaf hoppers. This is a buffalo tree hopper. These are um, just leaf hoppers, not the tree hoppers, um, aphids. And I differentiate between single aphids or aphid colonies. And you can see an aphid colony we have a big aphid with smaller aphids around it. This is an aphid colony. Um, we have different colonies. You can see green, red ones. We had some white flies, which are other flowing feeders. Then we had leaf chewers. And most of the damage in the field was actually um, caused by snails and slugs. Um, they really devastated the plants. It was a very wet uh, uh, summer in Ithaca. And it was really some plants that just completely ate, left us just with the veins. Um, aside from them, we had um, flea beetles, which caused some success substantial damage. And we had one caterpillar. So this is the single caterpillar we had in the field. It lived its entire life cycle on one wild type plant, pupated there also. Um, other feeders we had, we had some trips, um, we had honeybees pollinating, and then we had the non-feeding interactions. And here we also had very different ones. Um, we had flies, which were just like kind of sitting on the leaves. We had eggs laid by these are stink bugs, so they're hemiptera. Um, this bee was resting in a flower. It wasn't pollinating, actually. Um, ants, spiders, um, predators. So this is an um, assassin bug. Um, ladybug um, over here. So we can see the um, uh, larvae and the adult. And this is a parasite on the uh, bottom right is a parasitized aphid, what it looks like in the field, and what it looks like when we take it back to the lab um, with the wasp inside it. There's actually a video, but it's pretty disgusting, so I'm not going to show it to you. So, um, as I mentioned, I categorize this kind of into the different uh, um, interaction types and guilds. So we have feeding events, non-feeding events. What is an event even? So that, that's a, actually a question that we need to ask ourselves, because if I come to a plant and I see five leaf hoppers on it, which I did see, 
um, is that an event? Because the plant is one um, genotype, although the leaf hoppers are individuals. So the way I score it is I score one plant with one insect type as an event. So even if I have five leaf hoppers on a plant, I'll score it as one leaf hopper event. And these are all of these events that we saw, around 500 events. Um, they comprised of around 600 different uh, invertebrates. Um, more feeding around two to one uh, ratio of feeding compared to non-feeding interactions. And let's go a bit more into it. So in terms of phloem feeders, um, really the phloem feeder we had most in the field was our, were these leaf hoppers and really um, over 130 events of leaf hoppers. And they were significantly more on um, both nicotine acyl sugar mutants and the double nicotine acyl sugar um, mutant. Um, in terms of aphids, so aphids weren't affected by nicotine. So nicotine's in blue. Um, and they weren't affected uh, by the nicotine, but they were affected by the, um, by the acyl sugars. So both acyl sugar and the double one. But aphid colonies were affected um, also by nicotine suddenly. So aphid colonization, not aphid presence, but aphid colonization is affected by nicotine. In terms of the other um, uh, feeding uh, uh, interactions, we see flea beetles. They're not affected by the A622, by the nicotine mutants. They're not affected by the acyl sugar mutants, but they are affected in the double mutants. And this is a bit confusing um, in these the mutants. This doesn't mean there's an additive effect. It means that both nicotine and acyl sugars are sufficient on their own to protect the plants from uh, flea beetles. So if we only have acyl sugars in the A622 mutant, the plant is still protected. Also in the acyl, in the acyl, in the acyl sugar mutant, um, it's still protected by nicotine. When we lose them both, it becomes susceptible. This is also the case for trips. Um, snails and slugs. There was a very uh, tr there was a trend for the acyl sugar mutants, but it wasn't significant once I compensated for the multiple comparisons. Um, pollinators basically just went to wherever there were flowers. It just had nothing to do with the chemotype. Non-feeding interactions. So non-feeding interactions are tricky because they're usually rare events. So say egg laying, um, it's a very interesting interaction, but we only have nine events of it. So statistically, we can usually not reach significance for these rare events. Um, flies, on the other hand, we had enough um, events to make it really significant in both the acyl sugar mutants, um, which again makes sense. Acyl sugars are present on the top of the leaf and um, they um, are they act on contact. So flies, which are just sitting on the leaf and not consuming it, will um, be affected by this, maybe less than nicotine, which you actually would need to consume. Um, something, another interesting thing is spiders. So spiders prefer acyl sugar mutants. And it's interesting, we thought, does this have to do with them having more prey on them or just for the spiders, um, it being more comfortable for them to be on them? And I kind of observed, because um, there were spiders, there were these orb weavers, they made uh, webs between two different plants so they would kind of walk in between them and just see where the spider was. So we have two plants, where does it choose to be? And it would almost always choose to be on the acyl sugar mutant, which kind of gives, gives us a hint, which is this is, has to do with um, it being more comfortable on these plants. Predators were less on um, these two lines, on the um, A622 and ASAT and A622 and serpent mutants. Um, but this is probably has to do with the size of the plants. There's a significant correlation of the assassin bug um, abundance and the plant size. They didn't really seem to care much about the acyl sugars. They have these very, um, they're ha have these long legs. They're kind of above the plant and they kind of walked around pretty easily. They prefer the leaf, more leafy plants. Um, and parasites, so again, we don't have any significance in parasites, but what is interesting is that we don't see them more on the plants which have much more aphids, right? So acyl sugar mutants have many more aphids, but they don't have many more parasitized aphids. So if we look at the ratio of parasitized aphids to aphids, we kind of get a shift here. And it might point to parasites having an easier time parasitizing these aphids when they're um, on plants which are more protected, so the wild type plants. And then I kind of wanted to see the hierarchy between the acyl sugar and the nicotine. 
So I compare them to each other um, statistic wise. And leaf hoppers, we see there's no statistical difference, meaning they both equally protect the plants from leaf hoppers. Um, aphids and aphid colonies, we see that there is significance between both ASAT and the double and A622 mutants, meaning that um, acyl sugars protect much more. Adding nicotine to an acyl sugar mutant has no additive effect, um, but it does the other way around. Um, trips and flea beetles, we see we only have an effect when they're combined. So they don't have an individual effect, only when they're combined. Okay, and then I um, complement this. I performed some uh, experiments in, uh, in, in the lab as well. Um, and I used, again, the two feeding gills. I used um, a caterpillar and aphids. I used Mysis persica. It's a generalist. It's called a green peach aphid. Um, it's a very broad generalist. And we have two strains in the lab. We have a uh, green mysis and red mysis. It's kind of funny because mysis is green peach aphid, so we call it green green peach aphid. Um, but the red strain is nicotine adapted, so it's technically supposed to be more nicotine tolerant. And here I used tobacco budworm. Um, this was following an initial experiment where I tried um, beet armyworm, um, but it all died. So <laughs> even on my triple mutant. Um, um, Spodoptera exigua wasn't able to, to survive. So that actually shows us that we have additional metabolites um, protecting Bentamiana actually beyond these three. And we have a lot of plant protections actually in each plant. So even if we take out the ones which seem to, to us to be the most important ones, we still have other stuff there. So in uh, this um, uh, tobacco bedworm, um, which used to be Heliotis, now it's uh, Chloridia uh, virescens. Um, what we basically saw is that only the triple mutants were um, grew to be heavier than wild type. Now, this is interesting because serpent mutants, if you recall, had absolutely no effect in the field, nothing. In terms of the height, they were half a centimeter different from the wild type, and we really didn't see anything in any of our assays. Um, also here, you can see the serpent compared to wild type is basically the same. But when we add the serpent, um, beyond this double mutant, suddenly it brings us, to, brings us to significance. And this kind of shows us that a metabolite that even if it doesn't have an effect um, in itself, when it's added to other metabolites, can suddenly um, have a, a, a significant effect on the interaction with insects. In terms of the mises, so for both strains, we didn't see any effect of nicotine, which to me was interesting because the Nicotine sensitive strain should have been sensitive to nicotine, uh, but we didn't see any, it didn't see it uh, performing better in the reproduction assay um, on nicotine mutants. In both of them, we did see that all the acyl sugar lines, um, the aphids grew um, faster. So we have the acyl sugar, acyl sugar, and nicotine, and the triple acyl sugar, nicotine, and serpent mutants, and they all grew better in both the nicotine adapted and not nicotine adapted. And then I um, did some choice assays. And in these assays, what I have is I have Petri dishes with two leaf disks. Um, you can see these are the two leaf disks here. Um, and I basically check after 24 hours, I put the aphids in the middle and I check where they go to. So this is checking what they choose. And this is actually these two, the reproduction and the choice assays are kind of important to understand the phenotype we saw in the field. Because in the field, we saw that they prefer we have much more aphids on acyl sugar mutants, but we don't know if it's because they're coming more to them. Because just, you know, when an aphid, a winged aphid lands on a plant, is it more comfortable for it? And that's why it stays there and doesn't fly off to the next plant? Or is it really because we get the same amount of aphids there? They just reproduce better, they survive better. So the choice essay is uh, complementary in this um, uh, way. And we see here, so this is the green mysis, this is the not nicotine adapted one we see the acyl sugars are um, significant. So they significantly prefer the acyl sugar mutants in all the different combinations. So the double with the nicotine, acyl sugars, and also the um, triple one. Um, this is compared to wild type. And this goes, um, there are 21 different comparisons here of everyone to everyone. Um, we see acyl sugars are also, um, they prefer them than the nicotine mutants. They prefer, um, for some reason, not prefer the double one, um, but they prefer the triple one compared to the nicotine. Um, they prefer it compared to serpene, which was could have been expected. Um, 
and I'm gonna go on to here. And when I combine all the different leaves that have um, mutants in the ACE sugars, so this would be the single ACE2 mutant, ACE2 and ACE622 and the triple, and compare them to anything that doesn't have the, the mutation there, uh, we see that this is very, very significant um, compared to these. And it's the same thing also with nicotine mutants and with serpent mutants, and there, there is no significance. So I did the same thing for the red mises, and red mises, basically, you see, we suddenly don't have any significance. So these nicotine adapted um, aphids seem to be not only nicotine adapted, they seem to be in general more, um, more resilient maybe, more adapted to chemical defenses. They care less about the, um, the acyl sugars in terms of the choice. And this is in one big slide and I expect you to take a look at it. There's basically no significance in the individual levels. And, but when we look at the, again, combining all the samples together, then we do see an effect of acyl sugars here as well and not of the others. So conclusions from um, field trials and the uh, uh, lab experiments, Ser serpine, uh, the serpine inhibitor had absolutely no effect uh, in the natural conditions. The acyl sugar mutants um, were more susceptible to aphids, aphid colonies, leafhoppers, flies, spiders. Um, the nicotine deficient ones were more susceptible to the leafhoppers, um, to the aphid colonies, um, but they didn't have an additive effect um, in these interactions beyond the acyl sugars. Um, where we did see this um, effect that you need to lose them both um, was the flea beetles and the trips. Um, and we didn't see any interaction where nicotine was stronger than acyl sugars, um, was the other way around. Um, some more conclusions, uh, wider conclusions, I guess. Um, I think that from all of these, um, my conclusion is that nicotine has a minor defensive effect. I mean, acyl sugars have a much stronger defensive effect. And it's surprising because nicotine has such a high abundance in Bentamiana. It has 0.4% of leaf dry weight is nicotine. And that's an enormous abundance for a specialized metabolite. And it's only a secondary line of defense. And it leads to the question if it has some regulatory developmental um, uh, role. We do see this effect on the plant size, although it does seem to be A622 dependent, but this does hint to developmental effects um, being part of the pathways of nicotine, even if not nicotine itself. Um, right, we saw that the, um, the aphids on the field grown have to do both with choice and reproduction. And finally, um, we see, this has also been shown before, um, that sometimes in specialized metabolites, it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus zero equals two. So even if we have this serpene, which we would, if we looked on individual level, we'd say, this thing has no effect. Why, why do we even need these serpenes? I put the plants out in the field. They were exactly the same as wild type. Um, we do see suddenly that when we expose them to specific, more specific conditions, that in addition to other mutations, they do have another effect there in the background. And that's it. Um, thanks for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Hi, Boj. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, first question is the uh, these acyl sugars are derived from leucine primary metabolite. So have you checked the this leucine uh, primary metabolite in your uh, mutants and uh, dispercase nine mutants and wild type? Because uh, there will be chance because more because of primary metabolite there is increase in the primary metabolite there will be chance of more. And then, uh, this uh, increase in the aphids numbers. That's why they make susceptible, susceptible to the, 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 the. This is one of the question. So, first question is that have you checked the primary metabolite leucine and branch chain amino acids in your um, CRISPR Cas9 mutants? Let me get this. So, um, no, I didn't check those things. Um, 
that was wrong. Okay. Uh, I didn't check those things. Um, nicotine comes from primary metabolism. It's true, but the um, primary metabolism it comes from is very abundant primary metabolism. So it's... Um, yeah, acyl like... sugars. I'm talking about acyl sugars. Ah, acyl sugars. Yeah. Right. Um, no, we didn't check the... Um, the um, precursors or or those of the um, acyl sugars. No, that was um was kind of um basing myself over the more extensive profiling of Hong Lin. He did it like a year previously in our lab, and his um he has a twenty twenty two paper of all those uh, acyl sugars. It's kind of basing it on what he did. It was using his method to to profile them just for kind of abundance uh, levels. And uh, regarding plant phenotype of these acyl sugars, where you get a plant uh, height with less plant height. So this, uh, SL, uh, there is one gene, IP, isopropyl malate synthetase gene. So in aridopsis, it is known that this gene are, when you mutate and when you alter this gene, there, there is an uh, alteration in the plant morphology. So have you checked uh, in that sense also? Uh, well, the acyl sugars don't have an effect on, on the plant height. The plant, plant height I... is affected by the, the nicotine. Okay. Um, we do have some ideas of um, what the story behind this is. Um, if it's the, um, sorry, I wanna stop sharing my screen. Doesn't seem to want to open this. Um, but yeah, we have a few ideas about this, um, but it's um, beyond the scope of the field paper so much. I mean. We don't really know yet. I thought in the beginning it has a genetic effect, but the same mutations, it definitely has an environmental effect. I can grow them under conditions um, where I um, get the plants the same size exactly. Um, but yeah, that's a different project I'm working on right now. I'm growing them in hydroponics with all kinds of different things to see what the story is. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I think it's great that you can do some of these experiments in the field, but I think that one of the challenges is that uh, the numbers of visiting herbivores, it's pretty low. Um, have you done some power analysis to know how much really you would need to get some significant uh, effects, measurable significant effects? I mean, when can you really start making conclusions based on the results in the field? That's a great question. Um, it's it's even more than that because you can have several, you can have growing seasons where you have an enormous amount of insects and then you can have ones where you have nothing. I had one growing se season in Israel, different projects with waxes that we had um, infestation of painted lady butterflies. They were migrating from Saudi Arabia to Finland and there were hundreds of millions of them and the whole field was covered. So it, it's it's really very dependent on what's going on, the season, the location, everything. Um, the more the better, basically, is the um, is one thing. The other thing is, if the chemical effect is strong enough, you'll usually see something, like we saw with the leaf hoppers, um, that I sometimes had a plant which was just a stem because of the whole nicotine size thing. And on the stem, I could have like three leaf hoppers. So if the chemical phenotype is strong enough, it will kind of bring out these um, these interactors. You're right, there are rare events that we just won't be able to see yeah. um, the amount of um, plants, uh, the uh, stink bugs laying eggs just, was, just wasn't enough. So, Yeah, so what worries me also is the fact that usually when you get the first herbivore causing damage, you do induce defenses that may actually have others decide not to visit that plant, correct? Um, so I think that the amount of damage that you see and how much visitation you really have will be incredibly dependent on what is initially happening on that particular plant. Uh, yeah, it could be. It, it's yeah, it's definitely true that if you have um, induction, as I mentioned, you have many other um, chemical defenses in the background. And if you get a caterpillar chewing on this plant for some reason, and it induces the jasmonet, and then you get a right. bunch of other um, others. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, but if there are differences in the feeding, 
then we should be able to see them. I mean, the effect should be the other way around, right? So if we have a plant which is now more susceptible to caterpillars, then it's becoming less susceptible to other things. But if we see a plant that's more susceptible to caterpillars, which is also susceptible to aphids, for example, then we can be certain, I think, that it is very susceptible to the aphids because it should have been less susceptible because we induced more defenses. Well, I'm not so sure about that. If you induce the chasmonic acid with the first uh, with this first visitation, then there is it's going to have an impact, a negative impact on the next insect coming, which yeah. means that first visitations are probably much more likely, irrespective of what is the basal level of defense that they have. I'm talking mostly about inducible defense, right? So I'm just wondering how this comes into your conclusions. Well, jasmineat, you know, it goes up and goes down. Um, and plants that are in the field, so we usually, we work in the lab. I work a lot in the lab with insects also. And we're kind of used to having very sterile conditions. The plant is never in these kind of conditions. The plant is never, never is without interaction with insects. And its inducible defenses are always balancing themselves based on the rates. And insects also do a great job in kind of mitigating this, uh, these responses. Mm -hmm. And measuring several weeks in between, it's not that we saw for the first time, there were a lot of um, one insect and then they disappeared. It was really, um, I think we could, I didn't feel that the plants were becoming more defended as the season went. And I didn't feel the plants, because they were all attacked by these slugs and snails. Right. Devastated, really. It was really devastating damage. And I didn't really find that plants that were had less damage caused to them were more susceptible. We had wild type plants that looked really good, right? Mm -hmm. Very little damage, but they weren't more susceptible to, to any of the insects. They were much less because they were wild type and they had the defenses. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so I, the question I had was, you mentioned nicotine as the second line of defense against uh, these the, the insects that you sampled, but Nicotiana is uh, native to Australia in a more desert-like environment. And uh, the, the predators and pollinators there are, are totally different. And I wonder if, um, so I mean, there would be a location specific difference, but I was wondering if there are any comparable studies maybe by Ian Baldwin and in uh, uh, Nicotiana Tenuata in his field sites in Utah, where he has compared the effects of he or anybody else has compared the effects of nicotine versus AC sugars um, or these defenses in, in a more natural uh, environment where these species have are local to? It, that's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's another question, interesting question also about methodology, because do we take plants out only in their native range, like Nicotiana Tenuata in the Utah desert? Um, or do we, in general, take a plant from the desert in Australia and plant it in a wet winter, a wet summer in Ithaca, does this even have any relevance? We can ask that, right? That, that is part of the question. Um, and I actually think it does. I mean, nicotine evolved in Cotiana species around 2 million years ago, and it's in all of them, right? And it's true, Utah, you have your specialist, right? So you have the Manduka there in Utah, and you can do interesting things with a specialist compared to non-specialists. Um, but we can also ask questions, general questions, what feeding guild, what type of insects come. Um, and that I think is relevant also, not only in the um, native environment um, where you have very balanced things sometimes, and maybe you'll get very specific interactions. And here, when you kind of are disrupting this environment, you're kind of getting all kinds of insects which aren't used to it, and you're really seeing how these um, defenses are affecting non-adapted insects also. You can also get a kind of insight into evolution and succession and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely has, it's quite important, especially as plants expand their ranges in a warming environment, or just because of natural dispersion, dispersal, they change their ecological niche. I think the importance of different metabolite classes would change. Right. Thank you.
I have a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, very nice talk. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the phenotype of the mutants. So uh, acyl sugars are uh, substances associated to the glandular trichomes and, and they right. produce this stickiness. Uh, I don't know how clear it is if it's the stickiness that that uh, is bad for the herbivores or if it's toxic. I don't know if how much it is clear, but my question is, did you see any difference in the acyl sugar mutants around how sticky the plants are or the morphology of the trichomes, the size or something like that, or that was not affected at all? Uh, I didn't check it really um, scientifically, let's say. Um, I did feel that the trichomes were less um, dense a bit in these mutants, and they were less, they are less sticky. You re you really f you feel it, um, yeah. But that's also the the part of the reason to have choice essays compared to reproduction essays, because choice is kind of also checking the contact, and that's also what we saw with the flies. They just don't like to be on these mutants. Um, but the reproduction, you're forcing them to be there. So it's not, even if they're irritated, right? So, and the reproduction is more of a chemical defense, I'd say, than the, just the stickiness. But but still, you found that even the, the predators were less often, in, 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 were more often in those plants that didn't have, because probably because it was easy to go around. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just the spiders. So the 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 um, assassin bugs, um, they, they didn't care about about the acyl sugars. They really cared about which plant was leafier. They didn't really. The spiders preferred the acyl sugar mutants, and I think that might have to do with the, the contact. Also, again, because of the flies, the flies weren't interacting with the plants themselves. They were just kind of resting on the leaves, and they definitely preferred to be on the acyl sugar mutants. Um, yeah. So according to to your interpretation. This shows that it's more of a toxicity effect than of a physical effect. Uh, or do you think, do, do you see an experiment that will let you know that to uh, distinguish between the two, uh, between toxicity versus just a physical stickiness effect? I think it's hard to say because some of the toxicity can be, um, can be when, upon um, contact with um, uh, membranes. So these things can disrupt membranes and they don't have to be, um, obviously the aphids aren't consuming the acyl sugars, right? So even toxicity to aphids is toxicity, contact toxicity and not them consuming the acyl sugars themselves. Um, okay, because they are sucking. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, so, Again, if it's more, it's not comfortable for them because it's sticky or if it's really a toxic effect that's going into them and killing them, um, I think it's a combination. And I think different insects have it to a different um, degree. Um, but I do think it's a combination. I think it's both toxicity and, um, and, and the choice. I, I can tell you that in wild type um, reproduction, they, they just die. So they, if it's, it's not that they reproduce less, it's not that they're less comfortable. They, they just don't survive. So that's also Hong Lin's um, uh, uh, experiments. We check aphid survival, the aphids just die on these acyl sugars. So it's not that it's hindering them only, it's actually killing them. But they could be not eating enough because they are, well, yeah. I, if they weren't, yeah, if they weren't eating enough, I'd expect them to have less reproduction to reach uh, uh, smaller sizes, but still to survive. Um, okay. Yeah. Is there a question in the chat? Much. Uh, and from Andrea, can can tell you with this? Yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, great talk. I so mm -hmm. sorry if I miss or misunderstood this. I was I had more of a technical question regarding your leaf disc assay. Uh, you had mentioned that your measurements were respective to where the insects were regarding to the leaf disc. Was that correct? Yeah. I was just wondering. How did you measure the amount of damage? What, like, did you look at the damage of the disc as well, or if not, how did you? How can you account for chance? Um, 
So this is the choice essay, and these are um, aphids. So aphids don't really cause leaf damage, not that you can observe at least. And it was just, I was putting them in, so there was this big Petri dish, and I had two smaller leaf discs on two sides of it, and I put the aphids in the middle. And then I gave them 24 hours, and I came and I just counted how many, I put five aphids, and I counted how many of them were on each of the leaf discs. Um, so it's basically only accounting for where they prefer to be and not to what how they're interacting with the leaf discs. Mm, I see. Okay, thank you. Seemed like an interesting essay. Yeah, it's a very simple one, right? It's very yeah. low-tech essay, but uh, yeah. Suppose I have one more question. Yeah. You have measured this feed, feeding event in a particular uh, life stage of uh, plants or throughout the group develop in a growth of life, growth of the plants, this feeding event. So the plants in the field, we took them out when they're big enough. If you take them out too small, they just don't survive. So I took them out when they were big enough to develop from in the field. So they were around four weeks old. And then they were there for around two months. So, um, and they flowered there in the field. And it, it, it's it's a great, also a great question because different really um, stages of the life of the plant will have different interactions. For example, pollination. Um, we'll only see once we have flowers. And we know that plants that are younger are often um, better protected. And once they flower, they um, have less um, protection in their leaves already because they're um, allocating resources more to the reproductive organs. Um, it's definitely very interesting. Um, it can be sectioned, actually. Um, there are um, insects I saw only in later stages in the field. Some I saw only in earlier stages. It is a bit hard to differentiate it between the different seasonality, because the insects have their seasonality beginning of summer, end of summer. Maybe the way to check it would be to grow them in different um, uh, growth seasons as well, have an additional uh, uh, planting time. So we could kind of um, take apart these two um, factors. Thank you. I had a quick technical question. Really nice talk, Boaz, um, about your Cas9. And uh, I have a little bit of experience with the Ellison TRV um, method um, and wanted to uh, ask you to expand just about like when you said differences in Cas9, um, why you couldn't uh, use one of the mutants that you'd already deliver Cas9 to. So um, for them, when they tried this, um, and I actually talked to, to Dinesh Kumar, I think it was, um, about this, because I had these um, these plants of uh, Honglin, they had a different Cas9 in the background. And they said they tried it with a bunch of Cas9s. And this PCO Cas9 um, is the only one which has enough Cas9 abundance to actually drive the editing. Now, that being said, I did try this method on tree tobacco with a different Cas9 with a Puchta Cas9, which he usually drives in his 2014 article. Um, I think it's Fauser et al. He drives it with a, a parsley ubiquidine promoter. And in a SAFS lab, we replaced that with a tomato um, ubiquidine promoter. And I managed to get edits of uh, PDS um, with phytoindesaturase with that Cas9. Um, but it, you, you need really high abundance of Cas9. So I think if you're moving out, to, if you're doing Bentamiana, use the PCO Cas9. If you're moving out to different species, maybe check out where you get high expression. Um, the PCO should be okay. It has this potato intron, which affects stability, um, which probably increases it a lot. You can also play with promoters, of course. Yeah, thanks for expanding on that. Really helpful. Okay, there are no more questions. Uh... Let's all thank Boaz for the nice talk and for answering all these questions. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you next time.